You can go to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. That is where we ended off last week. But uh, I just want to, every time I'm going to remind you of what the Lord spoke to me about for 2024. And we need to understand that we know that God lives outside of time. We know that God is eternal. God is not limited to time. God lives outside of time. And that is why people that, are, that have passed away, like the Old Testament saints, like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, I don't know where Adam and Eve is, and, uh, but uh, uh, trust that they are also clothed in heaven, and uh, that they are also in heaven, and uh, Adam and Eve and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Moses and all those people. That's why they could now be over six, seven thousand years old in heaven because God lives outside of time. And we are created in God's image. But while we are still on this earth and things change, God knows and understands that we are still controlled by time. God knows that. It's called Kronos time. We are still controlled by years, by months, by weeks, by days, hours, minutes, and seconds. We, 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 we are still controlled by that. And, uh, and God knows that. God knows that. So uh, God's promises are not for one day in eternity. God's promises and gifts are for us for every day. Because God knows that we need them today. He knows that we're going to need them tomorrow. Because we still, we don't live. We can experience eternity and out of time. I mean, the moment that I get into the word of God, and this is not just a story. This is a, this is a fact. You know it and you can see it. The moment that I get into the word of God, time for me stops. Time for me stops. That's where when I look at my watch, I say, wow, I've been preaching for two and a half hours, three hours. And, and I just started on one point or something like that. Because time doesn't exist when you get into the Word. And I've experienced it in the past as well to, to be translated or to move outside of time. And uh, it's a few times that it happened to me. And I don't know why I'm talking about this, but it's okay because you are still searching for Second Corinthians. And um, is that it, a few times it's happened to me that... Uh, traveling from Cape Town when we still lived in Portable, traveling from Cape Town and uh, back to Portable, which is about an hour and a half's drive, and uh, Ansi would fall asleep in the car, and of course she was tired of shopping, and uh, so uh, she would fall asleep in the car, walking around in Canal Walk, you know, it takes a lot of energy and stuff in it, you know, and uh, uh, I, I don't exercise all that energy or burn that energy because I sit in the coffee shop and wait for her. So, uh, she would fall asleep, and, and then I would begin to meditate, my imagination. Man, I've got a, a live imagination when it comes to the gospel. And I would begin to imagine angels, and I would begin to discuss things with God and stuff. And many times, I will not even know, remember that I passed Maria's Achmalmsbury, that I traveled past Mariasburg, that I traveled past Piketburg, or whatever road it was that I've taken I won't even know about it. The next moment in it when I, when I, it's like somebody that's falling asleep behind the wheel. And the next moment, it's like, you, you know, I don't know if ever any one of you have ever felt that. And, uh, you know, you, you doze off and, and, and your car goes slowly and then suddenly you, you, you're awake. And, uh, and it's like, you don't know what happened. That's exactly the same feeling. And it's like, I'm suddenly awake and portable is in front of me. And I don't know how I got to it. And where it should have taken us an hour and a half, we did it within 60 or 40 minutes. I've experienced that. Not once, a few times. All right? And uh, 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 um, I wish it would happen from Mossel Bay to Cape Town. Okay. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe. <clears throat> and, uh, but I've experienced a little bit of it in it, you know. And... Uh, leaving here and, and uh, driving. And you know it's about two hours drive from here to Buffelsjag to, to Wellington, uh, to Swellendam. And, uh, and, and the time would go past like this. And I will see, so, so suddenly we, 
well, we are, we are halfway to Cape Town already. But it's not like the same. All right. So I uh, don't know why I had to share that with you. But that's where we're going to. Oh, yeah, with 2024. And uh, God understands that we are living in time. And, uh, and he wants us to know what his heart and his intentions uh, are for us and uh, in the times that we are living in. All right. So uh, just to recap quickly is that God gave me this. And uh, he said, occupy till I come. And uh, the whole thing comes down to the five points that God gave me. And the Lord said to me, look at the number five, which is grace. And the Lord said to me, but it's not just going to be grace. It's going to be great grace. Specifically the word great grace. Great grace. And uh, so the, the point number one was occupy till I come. And to occupy you need great grace. Then the next one was, he says, do business till I come. To be able to do business and to prosper and to be blessed you need great grace. Then he said, rule and reign in and with authority till I come. To rule and reign with and in authority, you need great grace. Then he said, be fruitful till I come. In other words, manifest. Be fruitful, prosper. Be healed, be joyful, be happy, be fruitful. And to be able to be fruitful, you need great grace. And then he said, the last one was, be faithful to my word till I come. In other words, walk in obedience. And to walk in obedience and to be faithful to his word, you need great grace. So that's why we're talking about great grace. And uh, so then the Lord gave me the scripture in Acts chapter 4. You don't have to go there. You are in 2 Corinthians. And uh, the Lord say, uh, spoke to me about that. Is that where the apostles... Or, or just quickly, this is just before God sent out all the disciples. And um, God said to the disciples, don't take any money bags with you. Don't, don't worry about anything about your life. Don't, don't worry about it. Don't take money bags or clothes with you. Because there's a scripture that says that the laborer is worthy of his wages. <clears throat> so you're going to work for me now. I will take care of you. <clears throat> But what I'm going to do, and I'm paraphrasing, is what I'm going to do is I'm going to put my peace upon you. My shalom, my peace. And it's not just free and peace. <sighs> that word peace, shalom, also means prosperity. Not lacking anything. Living in the overflow. Having more than enough. That's what the word shalom means. Is to have peace where you don't worry about being blessed and prospering and lacking nothing. You live in peace because you don't come short of anything. Are you with me? Then he said to them, is, when you go into a house, now this is important what I'm sharing with you. When you go into a house and the people receive you, or you know like with the church or whatever, and the people receive you. Now you cannot receive the messenger without his message. They go together. So when the people receive you and they receive your message, let your peace, your prosperity, that's why I say don't worry about what you're going to need because your father in heaven knows that you are in need of these things. But if you seek the kingdom of God first, he will add all these things back unto you. So he will be able to pay for your traveling expenses, Paul. Excuse me, he's going to take care of you if you need clothes in it, Peter. He's going to take care of you if you need anything in it for food, Timothy, whatever. But So let your prosperity, let your peace come upon that house. So say, that, say to that house, peace. So there's, there's something that gets transferred through the spoken word upon those that receive the message and the messenger. All right? But then he said, but if they don't receive you, take back your peace and shake off the dust and go your way. Because they don't want to hear the message. All right? So then in the book of Acts, don't want to go over the whole thing, but that scripture, Acts 4, where it says that, and the apostles, the disciples had grace. 
And there was great grace upon them all. And they lacked nothing. There was great grace upon them all. And they lacked nothing. Now there's a specific anointing. And this is where some people miss it. There's a specific anointing. That God places upon messengers. That's why in Ephesians 4, God says, He gave gifts. He gave gifts. What are those gifts? Not speaking in tongues, not presence. Those gifts were people, persons. He said, God gave gifts. And those gifts varied. Apostles. He gave them to the church. Apostles, prophets, teachers, evangelists. And upon those gifts, there's a certain anointing that gets released through those gifts. When you receive it, and when you receive them, and when you receive their message. That's why in the book of Acts chapter 4, it says, Great grace was upon them all. You're going to see it a little bit further on. Great grace, and they lacked nothing. Because there was a release that came. Through the apostles. That had the ability to get the people out of debt. Alright. And then we saw in 2 Corinthians 8 about this grace. And we're going to recap that a little bit. <clears throat> Is that there was a man from Macedonia. That heard about the gospel. Or what they must have heard about this grace. And he appeared to Paul in a vision. And he pleaded with Paul. And he said, please come to Macedonia. And will you come and share the message with us? So Paul went to Macedonia. And he preached the gospel of grace. Okay. Are you in 2 Corinthians chapter 8? Let's have a look at it again. So, uh, so we, we, understand, we, we know what happened. So just look at verse, verse 6. So we urged Titus that as he had begun, so he would also complete this grace in you as well. That he will complete this grace. So Paul says, I came and I left grace upon you. But I'm going to send Titus to you, and he's going to complete that grace that is now in you. And we know what happened is that in their severe poverty, they severe Via deep poverty. I mean, those people were so poor, they were deep in poverty. But they got the message. Now, you, now listen to this. They received the messenger and his message. They didn't argue amongst each other. They didn't argue with Paul that you are just after our money. They didn't argue with Paul and say, yeah, you are just controlling us. And uh, you, how can you expect us? Look at the deep poverty that we are in. How can you expect us? No, they received the message. And the message that they received did something to their spirits in their hearts. And they started begging Paul and said to Paul, can we please contribute? Can we please sow? Because we got the message and we believe the message. And we know what's going to happen because of the grace that's being released upon us. So Paul told them and said that this is the grace that I'm releasing. This is the grace that I'm sharing with you. That he, Jesus Christ, that was so very rich, amplified, became so very poor that through his poverty you might become rich. Nothing spiritual about that scripture. He's not talking about anything spiritual. He's talking about becoming blessed, living in the overflow, having wealth, being taken care of, living a good life where there's nothing missing, nothing lacking. You are able to pay for everything. There came a release of grace. And Paul says, but you're going to need a teacher that's going to tell you about this grace. Yes. All right? So then, now, 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 now look at verse 7. Now here comes a command. It's not a choice. It's a command. But as you abound in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all diligence... So I want you to 
abound in your faith. In other words, I want your faith to grow. I want you to abound in your speech. In other words, I want you to learn how to speak right more and more. Then he says, I want you to abound in knowledge. I want you to increase in knowledge. Then I want you to increase and abound in diligence. In other words, be faithful. But then, I want you to, and in your love for us, but now see that you abound in this grace also. What grace was it? The Verse 1 and verse 2. Abounded, the deep poverty abounded in the riches. So I want you to abound in everything. But I want you to abound in this grace too, that your poverty was turned over into riches. I want you to abound in that. Not I just want you to come out of poverty. I want you to abound in the riches. Now, abounding in riches doesn't mean that tomorrow it can. It can. You don't know. I don't know. Maybe there's an auntie or an uncle or a family member that have died and left you an inheritance that you don't know about. So tomorrow you might come into five million rand. I don't know. But abounding in riches doesn't necessarily mean that suddenly there's money out of the sky. It also means that, that whatever you need for today, you might need five million rand for today. And God can supply it. Tomorrow you don't need five million rand. You need 500 rand. God supplies. Always sufficiency for every day. And you still live in the overflow. Now you, 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 you might need a thousand rand to pay something, or pay a debt or something. Now God can bless you with a thousand rand, but there can also be leftovers so that you can enjoy your life and go and buy the dress or go and eat out. Not necessarily to, 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 to pay for stuff and to, you know, cancel debts or stuff. It's also to enjoy life. I have come that you might have life and that you may have it and enjoy it more abundantly. So don't limit God in the way that you think. But I want you to see that this grace. So Paul says, abound in this grace of living in riches. Abound in it. Oh, it's going to get good. It's going to get good. Then verse 9, obviously. He became poor. That through his poverty you might become rich. And, I, and in this verse 10, I give advice, it is to your advantage. It, not only to be doing what you began and were desiring to do a year ago, but now you must also complete the doing of it. And uh, that is, there is, is a readiness to desire it, so there is also maybe a completion of what you have. For if it is the first willing mind, in other words, don't say, I'm going to, I desire to, I desire to. Start doing it. You, 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 the, okay. The scripture that was in my heart this whole week. And uh, it's not necessarily about sowing and reaping. It was also about something else that the Lord was talking to me about. But the principle stays the same. He who waits for all conditions to be favorable will never sow. He who waits for all conditions to be favorable will never do anything. He who waits for all conditions to, to change will never get to doing anything and will never know the success that could have been part of what it was supposed to be like. Because you were too afraid to start doing anything. Because you were waiting for favorable, favorable conditions. You've got to start somewhere. And this is what Paul says. Now to chapter 9. But I say this, verse 6. He who is so sparing. Now, now, now remember, I didn't write the Bible. Okay? I didn't write the Bible. But this I say. He who is so sparingly will also reap sparingly. I'm not even going to read the Amplified. Because it's going to be too over your heads. 
And he who sows bountifully, now I know the Amplified says, so that blessings may come to someone, will also reap bountifully. Amplified will say, and with blessings. So, verse 7, so let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity. Maybe I must read the Amplified too. Because we did say we're going to repeat some stuff. Okay, I'm first going to read the King James, then the Amplified. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity. For God loves a cheerful giver. Just stop there. Now, some religious people take that scripture and they want to change it and apply it to their not giving. And they will use it this way and say, look at what the scripture says. The scripture says, let each one make up his own mind so I can decide. No, what it says is whether you're going to give grudgingly, out of necessity, or joyfully and happy. That is how you've got to make up your mind. Are you going to moan and grumble when it's time for you to sow, when it's time for you to give, when it's time for tithes and offerings? Are you going to grumble? Are you going to grow? It's got nothing to do with you deciding, oh, I can decide whether I want to or I don't want to. No, you've got to be faithful to the gospel. You've got to be faithful to the word of God. And Paul says, start with what you decided to do. So now listen to the Amplified. Remember this, he who sows sparingly and grudgingly will also reap sparingly and grudgingly. So when you begin to reap, you're going to complain. I knew the word is not going to work for me because I sowed so much and look how little I've reaped. I didn't even get anything when I sowed the little. So there's constant grudgingly. Okay? He who sows generously that blessings may come to someone will also read generously and with blessings. So you're not just going to reap generously, you're going to reap generously, and on top of that, God says, I'm going to put blessings upon you. Why? Because He's a more than enough God. He's El Shaddai, the God of more than enough. When are we going to... When are we going to... When are we going to start understanding God? Understand God, who God is. He's more than enough. He's more than enough. He's not just enough. He's more than enough. He's the overflow. He gives exceedingly abundantly above all. He gives you generously, and then on top of that, He gives you blessings on top of the generously. Okay, you don't have to get excited. I expect gifts from God every day. Verse 7, let each one give as he has made up his own mind and purposed in his heart, not reluctantly or sorrowfully. Each one purpose in his own heart. Ah, you see, that's all that this church is all about. It's just about money, money, and prosperity, and prosperity. Did you know that uh, prosperity and wealth is the most mentioned thing in the Bible? It's even mentioned more than salvation. Because God doesn't want you to get saved and remain poor. He wants you to get saved and then step into His blessings, step into His promises, step into His overflow, step into the good life because He wants you to have a good life because He wants you to know that He is a good God. He, not, the devil might have been good to you, but God is better. You can't even compare Him with the devil. Let's carry on. Let each one give as he made up his, his purpose in his heart, not reluctantly or sorrowfully or under compulsion. For God loves. Oh, man. You know I love this in the Amplified. For God loves. He takes pleasure in. He prizes above other things and is unwilling to abandon or to do without. A cheerful, joyous, prompt to do it giver whose heart is in his giving. I've just given you a mighty, mighty, mighty weapon, a mighty scripture that you can go to any time of the day and say to God, it is written. 
just like Jesus. Father, look at this. It is written, you are unwilling to abandon me. You are unwilling to abandon me. In other words, God sits in heaven and he looks at you and he says, I cannot abandon you. I cannot abandon you. I cannot abandon you. He is unwilling to abandon you or to do without a prompt to do a giver whose heart is in his giving. Father, look at that. I'm joyful. I wasn't grudgingly. I gave out of what you expected me to do. And I'm happy to take care of your house. So now you've got to take care of my house. Why? Because it is written. I don't think that a lot of people understand how powerful, how mighty, and how important it is. It is written. It is written. Verse 8. And God is able. Say, God is able. able. To make all grace. Listen to the King James. Verse 8, and God is able to make all grace, all grace. Now this is the grace that he that was so very rich became so very poor. Remember, that's the context of chapter 8. Remember, the Bible wasn't written in chapters. That was one letter written to the Corinthians. So now Paul says, this is the grace. That he that was so very rich became so very poor that through his poverty you might become rich, accumulate wealth. So now he says this. He says, and God is able to make all grace abound. Do you know what that word abound means? It means more. It means to be added more. So if we already have, and this is the grace, that he who was so very rich became so very poor that you through his poverty might become rich, and the word says that we might abound in all grace, it means upon that riches, upon that grace, there is more grace, and more grace, and more grace, and more grace, and more grace. grace. That's my God. I don't know what, what, that's my God. That's not the God of the religious. That's my God. The God whose hearts are right before him. Let's carry on. Make all grace abound toward you. That you always, say always. Always. Having all sufficiency in all things. may have an abundance an abundance for every good work listen to the amplified and god is able to make all grace not some grace not little grace all grace every favor and earthly blessing come to you in abundance I can just stop preaching there right now. Come to you in a bun. If this doesn't do something to your spirit, then come and stand here in front of the pulpit that I can slap you. I will wake you up physically. I will help you get it. You know, there was an old saying that we had in the army is that... uh, you can catch a a a a a a a a, a liquor van. What is a liquor van? A liquor wine. No, no, that's an alligator and a crocodile. But you know, like a lizard. And then you beat it until it acknowledges it's an alligator or a crocodile. So come and stand here in front and I'll slap you until you acknowledge that you can live in the overflow and that you are blessed and that you have more than enough. Okay, <laughs> And God is able, earthly blessing come to you in abundance, so that you may always, and under all circumstances, and whatever the need, be self-sufficient, possessing enough to require no aid or support, and furnished in abundance for every good work and charitable donations. 
Now, something that I've learned these last few years. Uh, no? Something that I've learned. That's good. You're going to get it now, what I'm going to say now. About, about faith these last couple of years is this. And uh, especially now with the house and the stuff that we bought. As the Bible says, let it be according to your faith. So now my faith was trusting the bank to give me the loan, which was in the natural impossible. Because we never qualified for it. But that was the level my faith was at. And the word says, let it be according to your faith. We got the loan. But since then, my faith has increased. Where well, you don't want to put your trust in the bank anymore. Now you're trusting God for something higher, something greater. So don't be put under condemnation because you, you went to the bank and borrowed money to buy something. But don't let your faith remain there. Because that was the level your faith was at. But now don't let your faith remain at that level. Get to a place where you can say, well, I'm not going to buy the next one through making, making use of outside. Like, what does it say here? It says that possessing enough to require no aid or support. Let your faith be increasing. Where you can get to a place where you don't acquire or require any outside support. Because of this scripture that says that this is the level of life that you can get to. Why? Because of grace. Because you understand grace. So you don't even think twice. You just obey the word. Because that's the word that you got for 2024. Do it by faith. Because of grace. Do it until I come. Be fruitful till I come. Be obedient till I come. Occupy till I come. Do business till I come. Obey till I come. So now you are equipped and you are challenged to step up to a higher level of life. Now you can, let's carry on. I'm just going to read verse 10. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food, supply and multiply the seed you have sown. How many of you believe that word? That he multiplies. And increase the fruits of your righteousness while you are enriched in everything. For all liberality which causes thanksgiving through us to God for the administration of the service. So in other words, we now get to a place where, where, where what you do causes us to give thanks to God. Because now we can do the administration of the ministry. Because of people like you. Are you with me? Okay, let's carry on. Verse 12, for the administration of the service not only supplies the needs of the saints, because this, this administration, this ministry, doesn't just supply need to some saints. We take care of some saints that are in need. But also abounding through many thanksgivings to God, while through the proof of this ministry, they glorify God for the obedience of your confession to the gospel of Christ and for your liberal sharing with Him. In other words, there are other people that are now saying, thank you, Lord, that there is a ministry where people give into, and we want to say thank you for those people that are obedient to your word, that are giving into a ministry, and that that ministry is faithful to your word to supply in our need. Because of them. Because of them. So other people benefit and say, thank you, God, which includes you. Because it was because of you. Let's carry on. Verse 14. And by, uh, uh, um, and by their prayer for you who long for you because of the exceeding grace of God in you. Because of the exceeding grace. Can you see the, the line of great grace? Great grace. What enables you to do that? Great grace. Exceedingly grace. 
exceeding grace. But you've got to understand that this is the grace. That he that was poor became rich so that you can be blessed. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. What gift was that? The grace. Quickly go to Ephesians 3. Let's read from verse 6. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. Now remember when Paul went to Macedonia, he went to go and preach the gospel. What gospel? The gospel of grace. Of his promise in Christ through the gospel, of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of His power. Now, I'm just reading this. I'm going to say a little bit more about the gift of grace. Verse 8. To me, who I am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given that I... Sh now, 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 listen, listen. I, I want you to see the line. This is what I want to do this morning. I want you to see the line of 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Of the guy that was in Macedonia. That was so poor that he said to Paul, come and teach us how to get out of this poverty. And Paul went and he spoke to him about the great grace that was upon them. Because he heard about the great grace that was given to the apostles. And he must have heard about, let there be peace. If they receive you, let there be peace upon that household. So Paul, can you please come? Also to Can you please come and bless us with the gospel so that we know what to do? So now Paul shares this now to the Ephesians. He says that this is the gift that was given to me, the gift of grace, that... By the effect of working of his power. So in other words, there is a, a gift of grace upon me that is releasing effective working power. That only happens when you receive the message. Verse 8. To me, <coughs> who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given. Now listen to this. That I should preach among the Gentiles, the unsearchable riches. Listen to what Paul says. He says, this is my grace. I'm going to preach to you the unsearchable riches. Listen to the Amplified. What's it? Three verse... Verse eight. No, that's why it doesn't make sense. I'm in four. Ephesians 3 verse, to me though I'm the very least of all the saints, God's consecrated with people, this grace, this favor, this privilege was granted and graciously entrusted to proclaim to the Gentiles the unending, the boundless, the fathomless, the incalculable, and exhaustless riches of Christ. Listen. Wealth which no human being could have searched out. Paul says, that's the grace that is upon my life. That's why the people in Macedonia could begin to plead and beg. Please, can we give? Please receive our gift. No, 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 you too poor. No, 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 Paul, you don't understand. When we started giving to you, something changed. Because there was great grace that you came and released upon us. Now we want to keep on contributing. We want to keep on sowing. Because there's a higher level of life that we want to get to. So please, keep on receiving our gifts. Keep on, we beg you, Paul, please take it. No, I can't take it. I've got to feel sorry for you guys. Hmm? Imagine what would have happened to those people in Macedonia if that was Paul's attitude. But there was grace upon Paul's life. And now Paul says this was the grace, is to go and preach this gospel to the Gentiles, the unsearchable, the unfathomable. 
The exhaustless riches. Wealth, what does the Amplified say? Wealth which no human being could have searched out. The question is not, is can you believe it? The question is, is can you think on God's level? This is what I'm trying to teach the church of Jesus Christ. This is why the church of Jesus Christ needs to think on God's level. Needs to get to God's level. Because there are stuff that we need to get done. This past week again, something stood. It was just an advert, you know, a documentary advert or something. And, and it stirred my spirit so much. And uh, two things. You, you can have two. I had two emotions at the same time. At the, at the one time, I'm, I was angry. And at the same time, I was excited. When I saw the entertainment world, you know, the Oscars and the Red carpets and the Emmys and the stuff. And I saw the wealth. And I saw how those movie stars and politicians and, 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 and TV stars and celebrities and it, how they influence the world. Because they have the money to do it. They influence the entertainment industry. They influence Hollywood and the film and the TV industry. The politicians influence the world with their political stuff. Why? Because they've got the money. And many churches of Jesus Christ are sitting there and they are so afraid of the wealth message, of the prosperity message. And uh, it's not a prosperity message. It's, a, it's an obedient message which leads to prosperity and wealth. Amen. That's what it is about. But they are so afraid of being prosperous and wealthy. Do you know why? Because they don't even trust themselves with the finances. In other words, that shows me that they cannot even be faithful in what they already have. They don't even trust themselves with what they already have. They are not even givers themselves now. That's why they don't want the wealth. They don't want the prosperity because just maybe they're not going to be able to handle it. And in the meantime, they keep their people in poverty and in lack and they keep the church in poverty and lack. When we are supposed to own the stadiums, we are supposed to own the, 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 the hotels, we are supposed to own all the buildings, we are supposed to own the industries and the stuff. We are supposed to be the rulers and the reigners. We are supposed to be the, the, those that dictate and decide, this is what we're going to do. The world must come to us and ask us, can we rent the building? Can we rent the stadium? The world must come to us. Like a bank that went to Kenneth Copeland and said, can you help us get out of debt? A bank. And you have a problem with him being blessed? Unless you've done more than any of them. Then judge. Are you with me? Man, now I feel like slapping some preachers. Now listen to this. Paul says, this is the grace. Wealth which no man, human being, could have searched out. Then in verse 9 he says, also to enlighten all men and make plain to them what is the plan. And then he carries on and he tells the people. And to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God. Verse 10, to the attempt that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church. The church must make known to the powers and principalities. We are blessed. You are not in control of the blessings of God. God is. Go to Acts chapter 20. You remember when I said, when Paul said, this is the grace that was given to me, that I have to teach you this? I'm going to read something for you out of Ezekiel. If you can understand what's going on. 
Let's read from verse 22, Acts chapter 20, verse 22. And see, now I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem. Now, in my Bible, I wrote there Portable and Mossel Bay. Because after we left our denomination, that was the two places God has sent us to with a specific message. Remember this now. I go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem. I go bound into, so I'm making it personal, in the spirit to Portable and Mossel Bay, not knowing the things that will happen to me there. Except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. All right, let me just make it very clear. We don't live in those days anymore. But we are getting back to those days where they will lock you up because of the gospel. But I must say that I haven't been beaten yet. Physically. I've been attacked, but they couldn't lay a finger on me. I will never forget it. I was called, you, you, you know, it's very interesting that when people are in, in need, and they suddenly need someone to bail them out, they know who to call. So here I am in Portable. Let me just share the story with you. This one just comes to my mind. Suddenly I received, one morning I received a phone call from the, from the, uh, the prison. They're just outside Portable, Furberg. And they asked me if I can come and help. They didn't phone the Duomini or any of the two Duominis. They phoned me. They said, if I can come and help, because they have a prisoner that's gone crazy. Now, if I can come and help them. So I'm thinking, why don't you phone? Because the lady that phoned me belongs to that other denomination that's in the, in the town. I said, why don't you phone your preacher? I thought, that, why didn't you phone your preacher? Now you phone me. So I said, right, I will go. So we went. So there was another warden that used to come to, the, he didn't come for a long time, he was, but he used to come to our ministry, and, uh, but he was still, it, uh, he hasn't been there for a long time yet. But he was working in the prisons department. So uh, he received me at the entrance and then took me to, it's like a, 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 a conference room. And the matron was there, or whatever you call them, you know, the matrona or the lady or whatever. And they brought in this, this um, prisoner. Man, and when he saw me, he went ballistic. And he just wanted to charge me. And this other guy now grabbed him and holds him. And they said, leave him. Just leave him. Nobody's going to attack. I said, leave him. So he let him go. And the next moment, this crazy prisoner grabbed a chair. But it's like a desk chair that's got the wheels at the bottom. He grabbed this chair, and he's about five, six meters from me. And he picks this chair up, and he charges me. And he's going to hit me with that chair, and I just stood there. And as he came right in front of me, I just lifted up my finger, and I said, in Jesus' name, wham, he drops the chair. And he just stood there frozen. So I haven't been beaten yet. But I came very close. Okay, by a demon possessed man. But I know what it is like to be persecuted by religious leaders. In Portable, in Mosul Bay, I know what it is like to be persecuted and disliked and lies and stories spread by religious people. Especially when you begin to expose some stuff. And uh, one story is new people that arrived in Portable contacted me. So I went to the house. I said, oh, yeah, welcome. He said, we want to come to your church. He said, big guy. He 
He said, and we've been saved for so many years and I play guitar in it and I'll come and do the praise and worship for you. So I said to him, I'll tell you his name. His name was Tony. So I said to him, uh, first come and build a relationship with me before I allow you to come and play. And he didn't take that very well. But that's okay. So they started coming to church. On the outside. Oh, ricochet. And one day I was sitting, it was about a few months, three, four months. I was starting to pick something up in my spirit. And, uh, and there were stories starting to surface about the ministry. But I started picking up something in my spirit. And I said to the Lord about them. And I said to the Lord, what is it that you want me to do? And I was just sitting behind my desk. And I took my Bible. It's my other Bible. It's in my office, my red Bible. It's falling apart now. And the Lord said, open your Bible. And I opened my Bible. And as I opened my Bible, I opened my Bible at this scripture. It wasn't marked in my Bible. Nothing. But it was like bold, standing out. Specific verses. And this is, I'm paraphrasing now, and this is what it said. It said that if a prophet knows that someone is living in sin or doing things wrong, and he doesn't go and warn that person, then that, and that person dies, then that person's blood will be on the hands of the prophet. But if the prophet goes and warns that person, and that person repents and changes, then the prophet is released. Or, 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 or the person, uh, the prophet goes and warns the person and the person doesn't change. Or listen to the prophet. The prophet is released. But if the prophet doesn't go and something happens, the blood will be, and I said, no blood is going to be on my hands. And I knew, and immediately the Holy Spirit showed me what they were involved in. You better know that you heard from God if you want to go do this. So I got in my car and I drove to and uh, and I confronted them and said that this is what the Lord showed me you believe man well I got close to what Paul says <laughs> beaten I got chased out I got literally chased out of the house I said well this is the scripture that the Lord gave me is that I came and I warned you your blood is no longer on my hands because you don't want to repent. Who are you to accuse us? During that night they packed up and fled out of the town. The next morning I went to their house. It was empty. They packed up, got a trailer somewhere. They left. And then the story came out that they left with a lot of debt where they bought on you know, on accounts, at the shop, and food and stuff. They left thousands and rands of debt, and they fled the town during the night. Till, till this day, I don't know where they are. And then the story started coming out, how they would molest children in their house. Young colored boys that they would invite to their home and, and, and under the guise of, you know, come and play and we'll take care of it, and they would molest them. That it's, it came out. So what I'm saying this is, I know what it is, and then the stories, and so in, in, in Mosul and in Portable, a lot of people, because you don't want to conform to their ways, because they can't control you. Amen. Some people try to control me. So now, instead of beating me up, they spread lies, they spread rumors. False prophet. False teachings, and stuff like that. So I'm saying this for a reason, Okay. So let's go. So I go bound in the spirit to Portable and Mosul Bay, Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. Verse 24. But none of these things move me. None of these things move me. I refuse to change my message because the prosperity message and the wealth message upsets a few people. I will not change my message. Nor do I count my life dear to myself so that I may finish my race with joy at the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. 
Now listen to what he says. He says, And the ministry which I received from the Lord to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. The ministry which I received. The ministry which I received is willing to go and teach my people how to prosper. That's the ministry I received. And I will not change the gospel for the sake of trials, uh, to avoid trials and tribulations and lies and ridicules. I will not change the gospel. It's time for the church of Jesus Christ, which is you, which are all of us corporate, to be blessed, to walk in wealth and prosperity and get the job done. Start preaching about prosperity and the blessings of God and the supernatural power of God and see how many people will like you. Now look at the word that the Lord gave me. You can go there or you can just write it down. Ezekiel 2. Now, just listen to me. I think God knows what he's doing. I don't think so, I know so. That God knows what he's doing. Alright? So God already prepared me in 1992 for my calling that I would step into in 1995. Now this is a word that the Lord gave me in 1992, in May. And it's funny, or not funny, but it's actually amazing, funny, whatever... How God has always confirmed my prophetic calling in the month of May. When I asked God about something. And I was born in May. And he called me as a prophet in May. So, this is a word that the Lord gave me in May in 1992. And it was confirmed by one of my mentors that was still... That was when I was still in the full gospel church. After I left the AFM. Went to the full gospel church. So God knows what he's doing. Because God knew, knows the future. He knew, he knew that I was going to leave. He knew the prophetic calling. He knew what I was going to. So God already prepared me then. And this is what he said. He prepared me for this scripture in Acts chapter 20. That nothing moves me. Because he's going to send me to two cities. That when I get there. There's going to be ridicule. And it's going to be like a beating and in chains. You hear what I'm saying? Verse chapter 2 verse 1 of Ezekiel. And he said to me. Son of man. Stand on your feet. And I will speak to you. Then the spirit entered me. When he spoke to me. And set me on my feet. And I heard him who spoke to me. And he said to me, Son of man, I'm sending you to the children of Israel. And God spoke to me and said, I'm sending you to the church. To a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. I'm just going to read the portions that the Lord highlighted. Once again, this was not marked in my Bible. Because in 1992, that was still a relatively new Bible that I got in 1990. So not a lot of things were yet marked in it. So it was bold, so I started coloring it in, marking it, and then I read it. Verse 4. For they are impudent and stubborn children. Who? The church. I am sending you to them. I said, no, Lord, send me to some good people that can bless me. And you shall say to them, thus says the Lord God, as for them, whether they hear or whether they refuse, for they are a rebellious house, yet they will know that a prophet has been among them. And you, son of man, do not be afraid of them, nor be afraid of their words. Though briars and thorns are with you, and you dwell among scorpions, do not be afraid of their words or dismayed by their looks. Though they are a rebellious house, you shall speak my words to them, whether they hear or whether they refuse, for they are rebellious. Then the last portion of verse 8. Open your mouth and eat what I give you. Chapter 3, verse 3. And he said to me, Son of man, feed your belly and fill your stomach with this scroll like I give you, that I give you. So I ate and it was in my mouth like honey in sweetness. In other words, I'm eating the word. 
And God says, when you begin to eat the word, that is what you're going to speak to the people. Whether they like it or whether they don't like it. And the Lord reminded me of the word that he called me in 1978 in May. Jeremiah chapter 1. I have called you from before you were born to root out, to pluck out, to destroy. Now get back to Acts. But none of these things move me. Now start preaching what I'm preaching concerning wealth, riches, and prosperity. And see how the religious people hate you. Oh, it's all about money. It's all about this. It's all about this. It's all about this. Well, God first prepared a garden that was full of golden riches. Before he placed man there. And then God blessed Abraham. God says, in you, all the nations of the... In you, Abraham, you're going to be blessed. There's going to be inheritance for them. And God said, I'm going to put some grace in the New Testament because of my son, Jesus Christ. I'm going to put some grace upon him. Verse 24, we're still in Acts. But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy. And the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. I will preach this gospel of grace until, until Jesus comes. Verse 32. So now, brethren, I commend, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance. Can you see something this morning, family? So what is God trying to tell us this week? Or this for 2024? It's the year of grace. But then you must receive the message. So that you can receive what is in the message. In other words, you, I, I'm preparing you what to expect to receive. But you must expect to receive what I'm preparing you for. An inheritance. Verse 35. I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said. It is more blessed to give than to receive. That's grace. Quickly go to John chapter 1. Let's read from verse, from verse 14. And the word became flesh. And dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Full of grace and truth. Full of grace. And truth. Now look at verse 16. And of his fullness we have all received grace for grace. Listen to the Amplified. And of his fullness, the superabundance of his grace and truth. The superabundance of undeserved favor, of riches, of wealth. We have all received. And grace for grace. Grace upon grace. Spiritual blessing upon spiritual blessing. Favor upon favor. Gift heap upon gift. Ooh. To whom did he give that? Read one John, uh, John 1. To all who have received him. To them he gave the ability to become sons and daughters. Sons of almighty God. And what happens? Now he has given us grace for grace. And of his fullness of his grace we have all received of his glory. So on the inside of you. You already have everything that you need to enjoy life. I hope I'm speaking to somebody. Last two scriptures. Go to Romans chapter 4. And now I'm reminded 
of while you are searching for Romans chapter 4. It's way past the book of Ezekiel now. About that, that caught up experience that I had when two of God's great men in America. I don't know whether they showed up in my house or whether I was caught up and transported to their meeting. But I remember I could smell the cologne on the one very clearly. And they both spoke to me and said, never change your message. And they laid their hands upon me. Said, never change your message. Two prosperity preachers in a vision, just like Paul had. It's like Paul writes when he was still Saul. He says, I don't know whether it was in the flesh or whether it was outside of the flesh. But one thing that I know, it's happened. And I'll never forget it because I could smell it. I even know the one had a double-breasted blue suit on. And they laid hands on me and they said, never change your message. Are you in Romans chapter 4? Let's go to verse 16. Therefore, it is our faith that it might be according to grace. Now remember the word says in, in Hebrews 11 that without faith it is impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder. Say this with me. Say God is a rewarder. So let it be according to grace, so that the promise, small p, that the promise might be sure to all the seed. Not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all, as it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. In the presence of him who believed, God, who gives life to the dead, and calls those things which do not exist as though they do, who contrary to hope, in hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken, so shall your descendants be, and not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb, he did not waver or hesitate at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was able to perform. And therefore, it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now, it was not written for his sake alone, but it was also imputed or treat it as if it was his only to him, but also for us. It shall be imputed, treated as if it, it is ours also, who believe in him, who raised up Jesus from the dead. Now I read that scripture, you can actually go read it in the message and in the Amplified. The reason why I read that is because of this. Now it was not written for his sake alone. So what is written in the Bible wasn't written for Abraham's sake alone. What is written in the Bible wasn't written for those in Macedonia alone. What is written in the Bible wasn't written for Paul and Peter alone. What was written in the Bible wasn't written for the Jews alone. But it was also written for us. So that we can treat it, impute it, treat it as if it is our very own. So you can treat the grace as if it's your very own. Go to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 12. There's so many things that at this stage God is busy talking to me about. But I first need to get this settled. Get this teaching done. Occupy till I come. Do business till I come. Be fruitful till I come. Be faithful till I come. Grace. 
Hebrews chapter 12. Verse 22. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. And everybody goes gaga. Everybody goes, oh, rikishi. When they read about the new Jerusalem. Oh, we're going to walk on streets of gold. We're going to kick diamonds as big as rocks out of the way. You're going to break your toe, man. Oh, we're going to do. And they all get excited about a Jerusalem that we already came to. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. It'll eat you 2029. No, it's going to eat you now. Everybody, or a lot of the end timers are preparing for one day when we go to heaven. And some of them that went to heaven say, oh, we saw the city far off. Well, God's got a blueprint on earth for what they saw in heaven. Your will be done. That's why you will see the scripture that goes with grace is your kingdom come and your will be done on earth just as it is in heaven. It must be done on earth. Oh, I saw the city and I want to tell you the glory, the light. And I want to tell you when you read in the book of Revelation, streets of gold and stuff like that. Well, my Bible says we have come to the heavenly Jerusalem. Amen. We have come. We're not going to get there. We're already there. So there's something that needs to be manifested on earth, just as it is in heaven. But everybody is waiting to go there when God is trying to get it to us. <coughs> Hello? Just like money. Let's get on reading. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven. So we are registered in heaven. So guess what? If we are registered as a church, I'm not talking about kingdom lifestyle ministries, I'm talking about the body of Christ. If we, the church, are already registered in heaven and we have already come to Mount Zion, to the Jerus to New Jerusalem, then what is registered in heaven means that those laws and stuff must apply. Because it's registered. So if you go to a place and you register in a city or you register in a hotel or whatever, then the privileges... The, the benefits of that place that you got registered to becomes your portion. Am I right? So what's our problem? We are registered in heaven. Which, is, which exceeds, super exceeds anything the devil can throw at us on earth. It doesn't mean that we will not face adversary. It doesn't mean that we will not face challenges. But if we can understand the grace, if we can understand that we are blessed beyond measure, if we can understand that we are walking in authority and in power and in the fullness of God, not just the fullness of Christ, but in the fullness of God, it doesn't matter what the devil is trying to challenge us with. We have authority over it. We can address it. We can speak to it. We can tell it to go to hell and get over it and walk in the blessings and the promises promises of God. <coughs> Man, <coughs> I'm swallowing my own tongue. I mean, if, if, if we can only grasp this and understand this, that there might be days. Now, I know I'm talking to the wrong crowd. I'm, I'm talking to myself. That there might be days that you just feel like giving up. Not you guys. I mean, other people. Not, not you guys. Not you guys, not you guys. I mean other people. Me. 
Okay, I'm talking about me. Personal experiences. Not, not you. You guys are sure. Okay. Or sometimes you just become motherless. Motherless. Despondent. Motherless. You feel like, what does it help? I'm just going to give up. God doesn't care about me. God doesn't hear me. I, I mean me, not you guys. Or you just, you're just fed up. But if we can understand the authority, we can face that. It's a choice. That which you experience is called the natural man. And that is when the natural man will not receive the things of the spirit. Now he wants to do it in the natural, in the flesh. You're going to fail. But when we take the things in the spirit... We will know. What does the Bible say? For a moment, light affliction. It will be just like for a moment. There will be a light affliction. Just for a moment. It's like not in this house. For a moment. For a moment, this tithing thing doesn't work. For a moment, this sowing giving thing doesn't work. For a moment, there's that light affliction. But for a moment, then it is. Oh, sorry, Lord. Oh, kitabu I worship you. I praise you. This is what your word says. It is written. It is written. Grace upon grace. It is written. This is the grace that was given. It is written. And you go and you take your Bible and you quickly open your Bible and you go to the scriptures that are marked concerning that situation that you're facing now. And you say, No, the word says, Give and it shall be given back unto me a good measure. I can get a good measure back. I need a good measure back. This is what your word says. I receive the messenger and his message and this is what your word says a light affliction for a moment but then that moment just lasts for a moment why because you are registered in heaven and you understand that that's what that's according to which laws you operate that's the benefits that you have that super exceeds anything the devil can throw at you let's finish Verse 23, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven. To God, the judge of all, to the spirit of just men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of, of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. See that you do not refuse him who speaks. For if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we... So who, was, who spoke on earth? We know it was God. We know it was Jesus. But did God show up and say, Hey, you Jews, I want it. No, he spoke through Abraham. He spoke through Moses. He spoke through Isaiah. He spoke through Jeremiah. He spoke through the prophets. New Testament. Jesus walking around says that I say nothing unless I heard it from the Father. Then he says to the disciples in John 17, Father, I have given them your words. Then he says to the disciples, now go and teach the people what I have spoken, what I have taught you. Then he went back into the supernatural realm. But yet he still speaks to us. Through whom? Through the disciples, through the apostles, through the scriptures, through the prophets, through the apostles, through the teachers, through the evangelists. So he still speaks on earth. Whose voice then... <coughs> This is where I want to get you now. If we turn away from him who speaks from heaven. So he speaks through the people. Those he has pointed in court. Verse 26. Whose voice then shook the earth. But now he has promised saying. And, 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 and you, want, you need to hear this again. Because I prophesied this in 2019. And it happened in 2020. And I said to you it's not over yet. Saying once more I shake 
Not only the earth, but also heaven. Now this yet once more indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken. As of things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us have grace. This is where I'm going to close now. Let us have grace in the midst of shaking. In the midst of econ economical failures. Oh, I want to tell you, 2023 was a difficult year. I want to tell you, 2020 was a difficult year, 2021. I want to tell you, it's going to get difficult, it's going to get worse before it's going to get better. No, not in my life. In my life, it's only going to get better and better until I step into the be very betterest. That's the best that I can. I want to tell you, it's going to get worse. Economies are going to fail. The rand dollar is going to fall. Food prices is going to go skyrocket. It's going to get bad. Well, the word says so that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. So who gets shaken? The worldly minded people. The people that put their faith and their trust in mammon. The people that put their faith and trust in the economies of the world. In crypto. In that kind of stuff. I'm not saying don't do business. Jesus said do business till I come. But you don't put your faith in it. You expect it to do well because you use wisdom. You hear what I'm saying? I don't want to teach on that now. But listen what he says. He says because we have a kingdom which cannot be shaken. So let us have grace. Not let us show grace. Let us have grace. Grace for what? Grace to live prosperous in the midst of shakings. Grace to have your needs taken care of in the midst of shakings. Grace to be blessed in the midst of econ economical woes. Have grace. By which we may serve God. So we continue to serve God because of grace. So we continue to give because of grace. We continue to prosper because of grace. We continue to obey because of grace. We continue to live a good life because of grace. We continue to live because of grace. Because this is the grace. That for your sakes. Which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. Selah. Grace. <clears throat> Such a small little word. But a word that's got eternity in it. That's got wealth and riches which is unfathomable. Try and say that when you're drunk. Wealth and riches that you cannot even search out. Exhaustless. Bountiful. And of his fullness. Full of grace and mercy. Grace upon grace. You see, God is always over. He's always more. Undeserved favor. Boundless. Exceeding. Over and above. Hmm? Oh, man. Do you 
you understand grace 2024 the year of great grace and rest and glory didn't God say in 2020 that he's raising up the sons of Issachar that will understand the times and know what the Israel, what the church supposed to do in those days. <clears throat> There's a period, a decade, <clears throat> about 10 years that we stepped into in 2020. The decade of the mouth. So there's a period, and we are already four years into that period. But if you can understand the times, it is supposed to get you excited. And I know when we are on the right track. I know when I'm on the right track. I know when, when God has spoken to me, and God has given me word for the year or for the church or whatever. I know I'm in the right track, on the right track, when the devil tries to attack me. This last week, just about every night during the night, in my subconscious, he wants to attack me with fear. Fear. But thank God for the Spirit. I don't even have to think. The Spirit just says, God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but of love, peace, and a sound mind. So I know that the devil, the devil, <coughs> listen, the devil is the one that is afraid. So he's trying to project his fear upon the people so that the people walk in fear and not step into what God has promised he's projecting his fear upon the people and I will not fall for it because I have a mighty weapon so let's conclude Occupy till I come. You need grace for it. Do business till I come. You need grace for it. Rule and reign in and with authority till I come. You do it with grace. Be fruitful till I come. To be fruitful, multiply what you have, your resources and stuff. You need grace. Be faithful. And obey my word till I come. You need grace. So it's time for grace. Amen.